Good day and welcome to our webinar on liability and litigation and managing exposure for COVID claims. My name is Matt Smith and I'm the Director of Training at Corvell. I'd like to direct everyone's attention to the Q&A pane on the right hand side of the screen. We'll be taking questions throughout the call and we'll leave some time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as we can. We are also recording today's call and we'll be providing a link to the recording on our website, corvell.com, and we'll also distribute a link to the recording after the event. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. Ed Burtnett is the Vice President of Liability Claims at Corvell. Ed oversees our national property and liability program, and he has many years of experience, including managerial, multi-line claim investigation, and complex litigation for private and public sector clients. Alexis Pfeiffer is the Deputy General Counsel at Sprouts Farmers Market in Phoenix, Arizona. Alexa manages Sprouts litigation portfolio, the administrative charge load, and general liability and workers' compensation functions. Before joining Sprouts, Alexis was the in-house counsel with PetSmart Inc. and in private practice. Jeff Strigi is the Senior Director of Risk Management at Cisco Corporation. Jeff began in multi-line claims suggesting in Houston at Cisco, as well as other corporate risk management and insurance brokerage roles. Jeff also serves as the President of the Association for Responsible Alternatives for Workers' Compensation, and he is on the board of the Houston RIMS chapter. Jim Davis is an insurance recovery partner at the international law firm Perkins Coy. Jim has many years of experience representing policyholders with general liability, first property and business interruption, cyber liability and officer's liability, employment practice liability, commercial crime and facility bonds, and workers' compensation liability issues. Jim is a frequent author and presenter on insurance recovery topics, and he leads the Perkins Coy coverage response to COVID-19. Rick Soames is the managing partner of Tysis and Mendez's Ocean Orange County office. His practice focuses on general liability, premises liability, personal injury, surety law, and construction law. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Ed, who will start our presentation. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Matt. Good morning. Uh, very excited to be here today. Corvell, this is our first liability webinar. Great panel, so we want you to interact with us. Uh, hopefully, some of the information today will give you uh, will help you to understand some of these challenges we anticipate coming from plaintiff bar up and coming for sure. What I'm going to talk to you a little bit about in the panel will uh, also talk about later, is, uh, especially Rick Soames who's going to talk about some of the claim theories. What, what we've seen so far coming in relevant to some of the claim types have been uh, the failure to warn appears to be the biggest impact that we're going to see Right now, under um, plaintiff bar, they're going to start presenting those types of claims. Also, as to COVID-19 infection claims for uh, failing to follow, you know, the written hygiene and behavioral guidelines that are set forth by the CDC. We also see that we'll end up having some claims related to defective product breach of contract claims for those types. Uh, we, we understand there'll be a lot more different types of claims that will come in in the next six months to a year. And again, uh, Rick will discuss some of those theories later in uh, the panel discussion. Claim types we've seen so far that have come in, we've had some raw cases uh, for nursing homes, cruise ship cases, um, employee wrongful death cases involving where they have come home with the infection and have caused uh, either injury or death to family members. And then the family members have brought a wrongful death case or a case against uh, the facility where they obtained the infection. So those, those are some of the things we've seen come in so far. What we anticipate is gonna happen in the next six months to a year is going to see the bodily injury claims that are come from the allegations of negligence, which are gonna be from the COVID infections that were obtained in stores, uh, restaurants, gyms, those types of things that are within our book of business. And we anticipate that those theories are gonna be uh, placing claims for the uh, all different types of situations for signage, for the PPE defective equipment, different types of those theories. So uh, 
we, we're going to have to put ourselves in some kind of position with our investigations to make sure that we're going to work with our clients to be able to, to uh, investigate those properly. So I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit uh, more in my next uh, line. But first of all, I did have a question when we uh, went out to some of the attendees as to what we we would see as far as subrogation triggers were concerned. Uh, I talked to our subrogation manager and some of the areas that we kind of anticipate would be the difficulty is going to be there's no real clear threat uh, that we can find. It's going to be difficult to pinpoint where the virus started. So I think for us, until you can work with a subrogation manager, manager some of the um, subrogation attorneys, people who are experts in the field to determine causation factors, it's going to be difficult to pinpoint to be able to bring a cause of action for subrogation. So the one area we've seen that might trigger would be ventilator manufacturing. We have seen a couple cases come in where somebody uh, was, uh, there was a fatality or somebody uh, was injured as a result of the improper manufacturing of one of the ventilator, either component parts or the uh, ventilator system itself. So on those cases, you'd need to bring in an expert and make sure that they, you properly protect the evidence uh, so that we can utilize that later in uh, preparing the case. So for segregation, I think it's really just critical that you get appropriate counsel early on in the case and make sure that uh, discussion is determined whether or not it's going to be foreseeable for you to pursue that segregation potential. Uh, but without the fact of being able to find the potential target, it's going to be very difficult in pursuing the segregation uh, on specific cases. Now, as to what Corvell's doing at this point, what we've received coming across out of our books have been some prison cases that we've received, which is kind of called the super spreader type uh, theory. And um, what we've done on our side is we've created uh, investigative checklists. We've updated our recorded statement transcripts so that we're making sure we're covering COVID type investigation requirements. Some of the statements have been added questions that are directly related to the infection causes and things of that nature. We've also put plan development to work with the client so that it's looking at the uh, areas of the um, plans that were put in place for uh, doing hygiene, for doing uh, behavior practices, uh, for doing the cleanup of the areas, signage, um, for video, uh, making sure that we can determine if receipts were available for when the claimant came onto the property. Obviously, the burden of proof is to the claimant or plaintiff to determine that they obtained the infection at the location. So part of that is going to be getting to the claimant or plaintiff to have them provide documentation that's going to support they've been at the location. Is there witness store employees that they can provide us identities that we can obtain statements from? Is there a timeline that we can get for them after you know they have the 14-day quarantine? where they can prove on the medical side that, that they actually had the COVID virus and you know the medical evidence to support that form the timeline that comes to the store location. So a lot of that we're doing internally and we anticipate when these flood of claims come in in the next you know six months to a year time frame that we're going to have to you know update those types of investigative requirements and make sure that we work with our clients closely as to what they're doing internally so that we can defend these cases and with defense counsel on the outside to make sure that we're providing all the appropriate investigation and documentation. One other area that we've been working at and looking closely is with the CDC. Now the guidelines that have put out and they're continuing to change, I think it's important that the main part of their focus has been on safety, behavioral and hygiene practices. And part of that is, is that the, the clients need to have a written plan and checklist in place, and that it's updated based on PPEs, the employees, the type of safety, and, and the, the real crux of that is the safety part of it. It needs to be continually monitored, reviewed, and whoever you're placing in charge of that for your safety division has got to be in, in, in on top of whatever the CDD, CDC is requiring and has updated in their guidelines. Uh, signage outside and inside the store is extremely important or restaurant and you're continuing to make sure that that's monitored. 
uh, cleaning practices that you're utilizing appropriate EPA uh, required cleaning products. Um, the timelines are set up. Your outdoor areas are only required to have soap and water, so it's not uh, going to require a disinfectant that's uh, EPA uh, designed, but you still have to make sure you're adhering to that, that cleaning practice. All your employees with the hand washing is very important. Uh, when they're sick, they must stay home. Uh, so all those types of practices that have to be in place and required by the CDC are going to be looked at by opposing counsel and making sure that you're adhering to it. It's going to be part of what certain things they're going to be placing in when they make a claim against the store, retail location, whatever it is. So what we're trying to do at this point, Corvell is working with our clients, we're working with Defense Council, we're putting these things together and updating to make sure that we're able to provide a good investigative background and uh, doing everything we can to combat this when it's ready to come through and, and that we can go ahead and make sure that if it's gonna be denied, it's gonna be denied. If it has to be uh, defended, it's gonna be defended. And, and then if it is a liability case that we can appropriately mitigate it accordingly. So if you have any questions during the remainder of the panel, let me know, and I'm gonna turn it over to Alexis, and I thank you very much for the time. Well, thank you, Ed, and hello, everyone. So I've been given the task of speaking to all of you from the perspective of someone at an essential business, we're a grocery store. And so my perspective, I think, is gonna focus pretty heavily on retail, but is applicable really to any business and for those of you who haven't been open during the crisis, then I think we have learned some things as an essential business that, that has been open this whole time that might help you all as you begin to set up. So I could spend easily an entire hour covering probably any one of these topics. I'm gonna go through these very quickly, almost like an issue spotting exercise, and I'll pause on a few of the bigger topics. But you know, some of the things that that are keeping me up at night uh, as an in-house attorney for, for an essential business um, really fall into three buckets. I think there's the employment-related bucket, which I'll go through first, then there are customer claims, and then things that I think could arise for us and for other companies on the general commercial side. So starting with employment, uh, first of all, I think you can't talk about COVID without talking about the potential for safety claims. One of the novel claims that seems to be coming up in some of the early litigation against very large retailers and a few big fast food companies um, brings up safety as the idea of a public nuisance. And in fact, I believe one of those cases has an injunction hearing today uh, in the fast food sector. So it'll be interesting to see how that public nuisance theory um, is applied and adopted by the courts. I think we'll be watching that carefully. Uh, retaliation and whistleblower claims are going to be big. They are big in the early cases that we're seeing. I think the last statistic mm -hmm. I saw was about a third of our claims um, were it's retaliation and whistleblower claims coming out of COVID. So uh, I think this can come up in a lot of ways. It can come up in terms of OSHA whistleblower claims. It can come up in terms of state law statutory whistleblower claims. And where I think this is the most difficult for employers is when someone brings to you a very generalized concern uh, along the lines of not feeling safe in the workplace. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to mitigation in a few minutes. Wage and hour litigation, I think, is a huge risk area, especially given some of the extra steps and extra work teams are undergoing for COVID. We wanna make sure there's no cleaning going on off the clock. Uh, when you're doing temperature screens and employee health screens, think through how you'll pay people for that time. And then there are issues related to remote work as well, where you have non-exempt people working from home. Do you have a way for them to clock in and out? Um, do you have a system set up to reimburse people for business expenses when they're working from home? Um, there can be business expense concerns around PPE, especially earlier in the crisis when masks and sanitizer were hard to come by. So uh, those are just some of the things to think through. I think there can also be issues with improper deductions for exempt employees, especially when people are working at home, as well as furlough pay issues. So there's a lot to dig into there, and I think um, the plaintiff's bar will be very tuned in to some of those wage and hour issues, particularly in California, where PAGA penalties will apply to a lot of those claims. Discrimination, harassment, and wrongful termination, we always have to be thinking about as employers. Now I think we have to look at this in two big buckets, 
first of all, is anyone being intentionally discriminated against? I think some big buckets that come to mind with COVID are discrimination against Asian Americans, which is unfortunately on the rise post COVID, uh, as well as age discrimination and disability discrimination. Those all have the potential to be major claims, either because of common is uh, accommodation issues in the workplace or because of the way people are being recalled um, from furloughs and layoffs. Then we have to think through disparate impacts, which is really um, the side of discrimination where we think through how a seemingly neutral policy might have a greater impact on one or more protected groups. And there again, especially for employers that have had layoffs and furloughs, think through your recall process, think through how you're deciding who's coming back, um, and, and really look at all of your policies and see, is this impacting people the way we intend um, to be on the lookout for that discrimination um, and, and harassment angle? For employers that have had layoffs and furloughs, uh, the Federal WARN Act and various state WARN Acts, as well as COBRA, uh, are, are really going to be fertile ground for claims. Some of the violations that come up, particularly with COBRA, are very ticky-tacky violations that, that can focus on semantics in the COBRA letters. So you need to make sure that your letters, whether they're coming from you or a third-party administrator, um, check all the boxes for COBRA. Leave and accommodations have become much more difficult in the post-COVID world. We have the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, which sets forth leave requirements for small employers, those with less than 500 employees, and really expands the Family and Medical Leave Act for those employers, as well as various state laws. I know in California, being in the grocery industry, there's special leave for, for grocery workers and others in the food supply chain. There are other states that have special leave, as well as many cities and counties that have jumped in and provided leave. What's tricky about these leave laws is that they are all different. So the eligibility is going to vary and as are the effective dates and when these laws sunset. So you've got to be very familiar with what's going on. And then you can't forget the duty to accommodate, as I mentioned in, in discrimination law. Um, the EEOC has been very clear that accommodation still has to take place. Uh, even in COVID time. So it's a good opportunity to get out there and review those leave and accommodation policies. Wrongful death claims have the potential to be an issue, perhaps maybe not so much for employees themselves um, because of work comp exclusivity, but for family members. You know, if the claim is that an employee brought the illness home to their family member, as Ed mentioned, that, that has the potential to be a claim. There are some interesting presumptions coming up in work comp in the various states, so you need to keep an eye on how legislation is developing there. And I think workplace violence has become a bigger concern. This is true for our employees and for our customers. There are some well-publicized stories about employees who've had broken arms or unfortunately even been shot and killed um, because they have tried to enforce some COVID-era policies like wearing face coverings or having only drive through service at a restaurant. Um, that are not popular with the customers. And then last but not least on the employee side is privacy, especially as more businesses get into temperature screening and symptom checks, that information has to be stored correctly. On the customer side, again, illness, injury, and wrongful death claims, which Ed touched on in some detail and which I know will be covered by some of our colleagues coming up here, so I won't spend a lot of time there, uh, except to say that I think these illness and injury claims can go beyond just contracting COVID and cover things like, for example, a bad reaction to a cleaner that's being used inside a business, whether it's some kind of respiratory reaction or perhaps even a chemical burn. So there, there are side claims, I think, in addition to just uh, a claim of contracting COVID that can come up in this context. ADA Title III will also be big, both for web access and um, for things like exceptions to face covering policies and other social distancing concerns. For example, if you set up something like one-way aisles to help your shoppers, are they still wide enough for wheelchair access? Those are things that must be considered. Moving on to general commercial, we've got uh, contract disputes that are going to be big, I think. Um, I don't think there's ever been so much conversation about force majeure clauses. Um, those are to cover events that are really outside the party's reasonable control that might prevent performance and tend to not be heavily negotiated. So any matter involving a force majeure clause is going to be very fact intense, very dependent on the specific language, and it'll be interesting to see how some of those come out. Securities litigation 
has the potential to be maybe a slightly delayed consequence, but a rise widespread one for publicly traded companies. And that could be either because the company overstated a benefit that they received because of the crisis, or was perhaps hit hard by the crisis. And uh, there's an argument that the disclosure uh, given by the company in its various filings is not affected. So I think there's the potential for statutory claims as well as derivative suits for publicly traded companies. And then rounding out the general commercial, an assortment of claims related to trademark, copyright, and labeling that are likely going to increase because more and more shopping is being done online. More products are being posted online, so all of your labeling requirements for meeting laws like Prop 65 have to transfer to online, uh, and trademark and copyright as well. More, more online means more images, so do you have the rights to those images that you're putting online? Data privacy is a huge issue as more and more activity goes online. And then price gouging has been a hot issue as well with a lot of attorney general investigations, especially in grocery and for other essential businesses um, based on allegations that prices um, were raised inappropriately um, during the crisis. So moving on quickly to mitigation. I do think that there are, are three big things that will help with all of these claims. The first one, which sounds very straightforward but is difficult, is staying current on federal, state, and local guidelines. Um, those of you who have been open know how hard this is to do because they were changing a lot. And for those of you who are reopening, now you have to dive in and sort through all the various rules and regulations that are out there. Um, these rules, CDC guidance, OSHA guidance, um, state public health guidance, these are going to be the standards of care and litigation. So you need to understand them and you need to figure out how you're going to meet them. Along those lines, you also need to document your response both what you've done in the past and what you're doing today. Many of the standards have changed. For example, face coverings were not being encouraged or required early on in the crisis. Um, the, the thought on how the virus is picked up from surfaces has changed over time. So cleaning standards have changed. Um, temperature screening and symptom screening was a later requirement. So you need to document when you started doing all of these things and when the requirements went into place. And then pay special attention to PPE, social distancing, and sanitization. I tend to think of those as the three big buckets of your COVID response. Um, and you see these big buckets covered in the federal, state, and local guidance as well. Specifically on the employment side, don't forget to train. Uh, you're training frequently on, again, these big three of COVID, um, hand washing, stay home if you're sick, here's how you use your PPE, here's what social distancing means for us. Um, and then for managers, I would throw in making sure they're getting some training on what to do to help prevent whistleblower claims in the situation when somebody comes forward with a general concern about the workplace being safe. You know, your managers and your HR teams need to know how to respond. Then don't forget your basics. Uh, remember that things like sex harassment, accommodation claims, these are going to come up because they are, they are concerns that happen in business all the time and COVID doesn't take that away. Uh, you also have to remember to investigate things thoroughly and document the reasons for your decisions, which is particularly important when we start talking about things like calling people back from a layoff, um, granting or denying leave, those kinds of decisions that can be challenged later on. And then address employee complaints. You cannot blow off your employees. You have to talk to them. Um, and figure out what's going on and what their concerns are. Those are some of the basics. Employees also need to be trained on Title III accommodations, especially your employees who are going to be stationed at the door and might be speaking directly to, an, to a customer that needs a reasonable modification. Uh, and then for your customers, also take advantage of using signage and posters and maybe uh, loudspeaker announcements in your shopping area to remind folks of social distancing and good hygiene and other practices. And generally speaking, you just need to know what your business is doing. What's going up on the website? Uh, and what do you need to make sure is in place so that you're complying with all of your labeling obligations? Do you have the rights to all the pictures you're putting up? Uh, and know your contracts as well. If it looks like you're headed into trouble with a business partner because of something potentially COVID related, make sure you know what that force majeure provision says um, and consider um, how all of this will impact your relationship. Uh, so those are some highlights of potential liability and mitigation. Again, just a brief overview, and I'm going to pass it along to Jeff now.
facilities, as well as a large fleet of delivery vehicles. And so we have to view COVID-19 in, in each of those perspectives. So from, a, from an exposure standpoint, we look at exposures in three broad categories. We look at exposures to our employees while they're working on site, which of course, as Alexis alluded to, uh, an employee exposed on site could take that uh, exposure home and, and infect potentially others and so on. We think about exposures to our delivery drivers at uh, customer delivery sites. And then we think about uh, potential allegations of exposure by a customer's employee, uh, perhaps alleging that they were exposed to COVID-19 from one of Cisco's delivery drivers. So those are the three uh, broad areas of, of exposures that we think about. So really in all of this, uh, safety and training is of paramount importance. We have at each of our facilities established arrival protocols, as, as I refer to them. These are the standard questions that many of us have heard. Uh, have you traveled to certain places? Are you exhibiting certain symptoms and so on? And then along with a forehead uh, temperature check. And if those questionnaires aren't answered correctly or if there is a sign of a fever, then the associate is not allowed to enter the work site and they are sent home. Um, and recommended to quarantine or see a physician. Um, we also conduct pre-shift meetings, both for warehouse associates and for driver associates, making sure that they're reminded of safe social distancing protocols, whether it be in the warehouse or dealing with customers offsite, and making sure that they're aware of and reminded of proper use of personal protective equipment, uh, how to properly don and wear a mask and gloves, how to properly uh, remove and dispose of them and so on. Frequency of hand washing, hand sanitizer and the like. Uh, we remind them of these uh, constantly, uh, daily. And then uh, specific to the warehouse and in support of safe social distancing, you know, Cisco, like any other supply chain facility, has productivity standards. And for our order selectors specifically, we have standards, uh, we call them pick rates. And they're incentivized to, to yield an accurate uh, selection in the least amount of time. And through the COVID-19 um, mitigation process, we have relaxed the pick rate standards, the timing standards, so that associates aren't tempted to violate safe social distancing in an effort to earn their incentive, but also so that associates aren't unduly penalized um, for a bit longer of a, of a pick rate. You know, delivery site safety is interesting because we, we don't control the delivery site. But what we have found is that our customers typically have their own arrival protocols. And so we conduct pre-planning, pre-delivery planning with our customers to be sure that we understand their arrival protocols and that we have processes and procedures to align with those. Uh, a typical Cisco driver may visit eight, 10, 12 uh, customer sites a day. And typically a Cisco driver these days will complete eight or 10 or 12 questionnaires and have their temperature taken eight or 10 or 12 times in compliance with those protocols. But it's very, very important that we understand the requirements of our customers, that they understand the safety protocols that we have and that we work together in alignment to uh, facilitate everybody's safety as best we can. The last thing I'll mention is at Cisco Corporate, we do have a COVID-19 task force, and that task force resides in our environmental health and safety team, and it's staffed by our EHS professionals, which include medical professionals, occupational health and safety professionals. The role of that team uh, is largely to keep uh, on top of and aware of changing guidelines, uh, whether they come from the CDC or whether they come from local municipalities or from states, um, so that we are sure to be in compliance with, with whatever the protocols are, whatever the safety measures are that are coming from those experts. They also really inform Cisco's reopening guidelines. Um, like, like Alexis, we are an essential employer. We've been delivering groceries throughout the COVID-19 crisis, but our administrative offices, both at our operating companies and here at Cisco Corporate in Houston, have been closed. And so this task force is understanding the reopening schedules and the reopening pace in various jurisdictions and venues uh, to help inform our local site managers as safe reopening guidelines, when that might occur and if it occurs and when it occurs 
uh, the processes that we would deploy to uh, to make that happen. And the last thing is the any communication, especially enterprise wide communications throughout Cisco emanate from our COVID-19 task force. And that just ensures consistency of messaging um, and, and makes sure that there aren't mixed messages going out and that we're actually informing people and, and not confusing them. So I covered our broad areas of liability exposures, but from a mitigation standpoint, again, it's safety, 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 training, training, training. It's making sure that all of the protocols that we have in place are flawlessly executed, uh, flawlessly executed, and that they are well conceived and that they're well documented. You know, I've learned over the years that the worst thing an organization can do is put forth a policy or a procedure and then fail to execute it, or put forth a policy and procedure and execute it, but fail to document that execution. Um, if we have the unfortunate circumstance of a lawsuit of any type presented against the company, our objective is to have solid evidence, solid documentation that we can package up very neatly and hand off to outside counsel so that they can conceive and provide the best possible defense to Cisco um, as, as they possibly can. So with that, I'm gonna pass off to um, attorney Jim Davis and he'll cover insurance coverage. Great, uh, thanks Jeff. Uh, Jim Davis from Perkins Coie. I'm an insurance recovery partner and heading up our COVID-19 uh, insurance coverage response. And I just wanted to go through some of the, you know, overarching coverage issues that are arising and we expect to rise arise over the next few months uh, relating to COVID-19 claims. And the first area is general liability. And I, I, I think if I just give you some tips on each of these uh, insurance lines, you might find them helpful as you move forward. And, and with respect to general liability, this is going to respond to third party claims uh, that they were uh, injured um, or their property was injured as a result of interacting with your businesses. And one of the things that we've noticed with uh, general liability through the years is that companies are reticent to provide notice of potential claims. Uh, they will hear about an issue. They will know that there's a possibility of a claim coming down uh, the pike. They have, in other words, a notice of circumstances, and they often wait a year or two until the lawsuit is filed before giving notice to their insurers. And this creates a, an issue for coverage uh, that, that really is unnecessary. So one thing I would encourage is to, to give prompt and, and complete notice to your insurers as early as possible when you run into these COVID-19 situations. Um, secondly, I think you should be attentive to your contractual indemnity uh, relationships with other companies, vendors, suppliers, contractors, and be sure that you understand what you're responsible for, what they're responsible for. And one key area is whether you have a right to make a, an insurance claim under an, as an additional insured under someone else's insurance. And this often arises in liability situations uh, and many states require that an additional insured provide their own notice. And so instead of just writing an indemnity demand to the party that you're dealing with and asking them to also go tell their insurer, Insurers are often confused by that process as they only understand that they're covering their named insured and they don't quite understand that you are making a separate additional insured claim. Uh, so you should really make sure you send notices to those insurer, insurers as an additional insured separately. So a couple of general liability issues there. I think you've all heard about the property business interruption issues that uh, everyone is facing. You basically have a Hurricane Katrina in 50, K, uh, 50 states. So uh, everyone is a policyholder in this situation. And one of the you know, general beliefs out there is that there is no coverage for COVID-19 claims. That's not correct. Uh, many of the policies do respond uh, to, the, to this situation. And, and many of them have a specific uh, virus exclusion uh, that may or may not you know, cause them to respond. So I think that the, the first thing that's important to understand is that Companies need to go ahead and make a claim. Uh, when they renew their coverage, what we're seeing is that uh, insurers are inserting COVID-19 exclusions into their 
uh, business and uh, business interruption and property policies on renewal. So this is the last set of policies that you're going to have a chance to, to make a claim on. Uh, secondly, the legislation that is being formulated by the states and the federal government is still in its infancy. And one of the things we've learned through dealing with prior disasters is that governments like to think about first use up all of your private resources before you um, ask for government assistance. And for example, if you want to get an SBA disaster loan, they will want to see that you made an effort to get a loan from a regular institution without using the SBA program and that you made an insurance claim and it was denied. So one of the reasons you need to make a claim is that even if it's denied, you have that uh, proof. And it's very possible that future legislation will say for those companies that bought business interruption and insurance but received a, a denial, we're going to provide a certain amount of a relief, probably as a grant. So I think that's something to think about with property and BI with COVID-19. Just briefly on cyber liability, uh, the use of contact tracing is probably the most effective way to control uh, the spread of COVID-19, both through government action, but companies should think about it as well. And in, in doing that, you may be collecting people's personal information, healthcare information. Uh, you may be using it, storing it, distributing it in some way. And all of those things might uh, run afoul of privacy laws like the CCPA um, or biometric information laws like the Biometric Information Privacy Act in Illinois. And so you should be aware about whether or not your cyber liability policy is going to respond to actions that you're taking to try to control the spread of COVID-19 in, in your business. And that means checking the provisions and seeing how they would respond to that type of claim and asking your broker. The, the last area would be employment practices liability. Uh, this is a tough one. I, I get a lot of questions about whether a specific claim will apply under uh, one of these policies. And it, I think it's safe to say that this is a type of coverage that is written in many, many different ways. Uh, with subtle uh, differences. And the, the key for you at, at this stage is to get out the policy and check the definition of employ, employment wrongful act. Um, how that's defined is different in many different policies. Some are very, very broad and have a, a nice laundry list of the type of claims that you can expect to be covered. Um, and others are much uh, narrower than you might expect. Uh, and while you're doing that, compare it to your bodily injury exclusion. Some are extremely broad, some are, are much more narrow. And think about how those two are going to interact with these types of claims. And, and finally, oral discussions with your employees where they're raising some kind of an employment practice act, you know, discrimination, um, harassment, whatever it is re with relation to COVID-19, it's important to give notice to your insurers when you hear something orally those claims often turn into lawsuits or other affirmative action six months later, a year later. And it's important that you, you make your claim and, and don't uh, create a, an issue under your insurance. So those are just some tips with your insurance coverage. And now I'll pass it on to uh, Rick, who will talk about uh, defending these cases and liability. Thank you, Jim. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is, as everyone, as Matt had said, my name is Rick Soames. I'm the of the Orange County office for Tyson and Mendez. And I'm really happy to be here. We got a great panel. Um, I'm gonna have to pick up my game a little bit because everybody's just been knocking out of the park. And this is such a fascinating topic. So first off, from a legal perspective, I wanted to go over the lawsuit example, some ideas or thoughts on the type of claims that will be filed in the future that have been filed. For example, on a general liability perspective, we're talking about maybe possibly or most likely negligent failure to warn of dangerous condition, COVID-19 infections resulting from handling a product or failing to follow applicable, applicable hygiene practices and failing to warn customers and employees. The liability of products sold by a third party vendor or liability for services provided by a vendor. Defective PPE, defective product lawsuits, product liability claims tied to marketing, representation and alleged breach of warranties. From a labor and employment standpoint, um, I believe Alexis already touched upon this, uh, failure to accommod accommodate employees with COVID-19 listed vulnerabilities, denying paid sick leave, 
failing to provide PPE, wage and hour disputes, retaliation, whistleblower claims. And uh, since, since May, the lawsuits that we have seen that have been filed across the nation have involved uh, claims regarding prison conditions, insurance dispute, disputes, as, as Jim had mentioned, business interruption, uh, contract disputes, failure to perform, maybe concerts not going forward, Ticketmaster being sued for not reimbursing for the tickets that were purchased or airline ticket refunds, civil right claims, employment, wrongful death, medical malpractice, class action claims against health departments for failing to monitor nurse, nursing homes, and more importantly, emotional distress claims for, for little boys who have bad head haircuts during quarantine. I'm just kidding, just seeing if you're paying attention. But my four-year-old has a claim against mommy because she, he's very unhappy of the haircut or the handiwork that she performed a couple of weeks ago. So getting back to all seriousness, um, these lawsuits that have been filed have targeted hospitals, long-term care facilities, airlines, cruise lines, ticket brokers, fitness facilities, to name a few. Lawsuits have, have targeted states or been filed in states like New York, California, Florida, Texas, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Washington. Next slide, please. Uh, from a legal perspective, the biggest anticipated exposure covers three areas, verifiable super spreader events, wrongful death, and egregious facts. And I wanna to touch upon this. Touching upon the super spreader event, oftentimes we think of uh, maybe a concert or a big event, but it also can touch, it can be in a store or a restaurant. The key facts to remember is an average person spreads to two people, but many more at an event or gathering. These indoor gatherings with lots of people have potential tight quarters, so they're, they're open for a possibility of exposure. Some examples include religious services, birthday parties, concerts, sporting events, cruise ships, daycare facilities, hotels, movie theaters, gyms, clubs, team sports, hospitals, nursing facilities, airplanes, theme parks, wedding schools, prisons, and meatpacking plants. And as mentioned, stores and restaurants can also be a forum for a possible super spreader event. Now, it's not, it's not about, for a super spreader event, it's not about the person being more contagious, but access to greater number of people and spaces. So we have to look to our defenses. And the first defense that comes up is assumption of the risk. But plaintiff will argue, did the defendant who created the gathering, gathering have a duty to warn of the danger in advance or a duty to provide safety measures? The measures to prevent such an event from occurring are following the guidelines set by the state and local authorities, developing and implementing policies and procedures in response to changes to the guidelines, as everyone has mentioned today, reduce crowd density, wearing masks and providing possibly PPE, um, changing seating layouts, insulation of improved ventilation. The other area of the list of the anticipated exposure is obviously wrongful death, nursing home or malpractice, or possibly maybe an employee going home and infecting a family member and the family member has some serious pre-existing conditions and may have passed away, unfortunately. The other area is egregious facts. I think this is the narrative that plaintiff will push regardless of whether the safety measures are in place. The egregious facts include any facts that play into profits over safety narrative crafted by the plaintiff's counsel. As stated, they will push this theory along the case and present this in front of the jury that safety measures were not being implemented. So it's so important that, that the policies and procedures that are put in place are enforced for employees and customers. And that includes failing, they'll touch upon failing to warn, not providing PPE, masks, respirators, physical barriers, and not training employees. Most importantly, on the next slide, we'll talk about, talking about defending the case. And moving on, we're focusing on that narrative that plaintiff will try to push the profits over safety. They're going to focus on the failure to act or a business action that may have caused the exposure. They're going to focus on the safety of the community. The safety of the community is at stake. This is the narrative that they will push profits over safety. But I think as defense counsel, we need to change this narrative 
and get back to the facts. We need to focus on the facts going forward because we have a good story to tell. How do we do this? As everyone has emphasized, we need policies and procedures in place. And it, it's another thing to have a policy and procedure, but not to enforce it. Next slide, please. Or excuse me, same slide. Um, as, as stated with the policy and procedures, if you don't enforce the policies, there's no, there's no point of having the policy in place. And this often sometimes happens because we're busy. Um, people have ongoing business going on, but you know, there needs to be some checks and balances in place, ensuring that the employees are trained and they're advised of any dangers that, that could take place in their environment, and as well as the customers. Some of these guidelines to develop an action plan would include hazard identification, hazard being COVID, hazard prevention pr procedures, employee training, medical monitoring, surveillance, and record keeping. Now, it's so important that we document all these measures that are being taken. And I think one thing we need to maybe as a motto is to emphasize to our clients that they must take pride in the measures that they took during this pandemic. Documenting is taking pride. And so as part of this is preserving all the evidence. It's, it's telling the story and documenting the story that we took action, we took responsibility throughout the pandemic by implementing safe, safety procedures that protected our employees and customers. This proof of implementation will include written documentation of the policies and procedures that the guidelines at that time were being implemented and being adjusted and that employees were documenting that they had been trained and were implementing the policy and procedures. We also, it's important to show that we had proof of warnings to our customers and employees. We can do this by written documentation, but we also can do this through video and photographs or statements. You can show, we can show during the pandemic that we were making alterations as the guidelines changed. This could be showing the glass shields at the checkout counter, the social distancing markers and various barriers that were implemented. We're only gonna have, we're gonna have a recollection of what took place, but to have the photographic evidence of this is so important in telling the story that we took action. But on the flip side, it's not just about us preserving the evidence. We must put the burden on the plaintiff. The plaintiff must preserve their evidence as well. So I recommend, as we always do in most cases, in all cases, is to send a demand for preservation of evidence upon notice of the claim. The letter should demand preservation of the following things. And this is not a, a, an exhaustive list that we can add to this list, but some of the things that I could think of were videos of the scene. You may have a plaintiff that may have a, a, a video from their iPhone showing that safety measures were not in place or photographs of the scene, statements that they have, receipts from the store that they that they uh, went to on the day of the incident when they were exposed. Oftentimes, they'll claim they do not have a receipt, but let's put the burden on them. You may wanna look at their banking records. I know it may be difficult to obtain this information, but it's relevant and we can file a motion to compel. The banking records will show the activity that they, that they underwent during the pandemic. Maybe they were not social distancing or quarantining, during the time of the pandemic, they may have gone to another store that may have not had these same kind of safety measures that our clients do. We also want to ask for the travel records. This is important because in the, during this time, there may be times when they went on a vacation or they traveled somewhere and were exposed to a certain um, environment. We also want the medical records and billing records in any written documentation memorializing exposure. It's so important to have this letter because we can use it later on in defense of our case. The next item that's very important is venue. Venue is so important. In any situation, I would recommend to my clients to remove to federal court if possible. Why? Because there's a wider jury pool, a larger geographic range, and a stronger likelihood a jury will award a lower verdict and stricter discovery rules. There are limits on discovery, and then also a better chance of a successful motion for summary judgment, which will get the case dismissed. The next targeted item I put on there is a written and deposition discovery plan targeted to produce evidence of exposure 
and potentially establish that another event caused the exposure to COVID and mitigation of damages. This type of written and discovery plan includes um, interrogatories and subpoenas that should be focused on plaintiff's pre-existing conditions, a wide net on the medical history. Now, plaintiff will try to limit the treatment to the COVID treatment, but we need to go wider. We need to find out who the primary care physicians are. We need to know the whole host of treaters that they've seen well before the pandemic started to find out if they had any pre-existing conditions or if they even treated for the COVID itself. How do we do this? We send interrogatories. We retain services who search plaintiff's medical history because we don't, we have to be aware that plaintiffs are not going to be candid as to their medical history. A company like Trace America can search and canvas the area to see the types of hospitals and doctors that plaintiff has treated with, especially in situations where they've gone to lean doctors and they're not providing the list of their primary care physician or the plaintiff is uninsured. We also would want to get the pharmacy records. Pharmacy records are very helpful because it'll help identify the, the treaters that they've seen during this time, well before the incident and after the incident. Insurance records are also a great source, obviously for billing purposes, evaluating the bills, but also identifying treaters. And also there may also be, we also can do some research as to other losses they filed in the past. They may have also filed another lawsuit against another store for exposure to COVID because they're not really certain as to how they, how they were exposed to COVID in the first place. We also want to send discovery or and tap into this into what type of entertainment that the plaintiff um, enjoys or was involved with shortly before the incident or maybe after the incident. Uh, did they see Billy Idol in Vegas in March prior to the quarantine? That was on my pre-quarantine bucket list. Now I'm stuck to karaoke, karaoke concerts and singing in the shower or singing on the treadmill. Um, we also want to look at the types of hobbies and memberships that the plaintiff was involved with. Were they active members in a gym or their clubs or types of religious services where they may have been exposed to COVID in other ways? We also look to their social media history. We also need, we want to get a private investigator to look into the social media and maybe even do some surveillance. We want to look at plaintiff's travel history to see if they traveled somewhere out of the country or another location where there was a, a higher level of COVID exposure, maybe vacations that they went on. See if they've had any prior viruses. Also explore the family members' behaviors, find out if they were exposed through a family member, maybe the maybe the family member has a job, maybe they were essential services, or they have they were involved in activities or traveling. Then we want to focus on depositions. Obviously, we want to take the take the deposition of the plaintiff, but also the treaters, the coroner, billing PMKs, family members, and co-workers, and employers. Obviously, plaintiff is going to try to argue that some of these witnesses are not relevant and try to try to block any efforts to find this information. But I think in this situation, because there's so much uncertainty, as Ed had said, it's very difficult to, to pinpoint when the person was exposed. So I think we have standing to explore a wider net. And that's the argument that we will make. And definitely we would have to file motions to compel to assert that position. The next will be retaining experts early on to assist with discovery. The, the experts I'm envisioning is a health and safety expert to testify regarding the standards of care and the guidelines that were implemented during the pandemic. Because there's going to be changes during the timeline and we need someone to to say in the month of March, these were the guidelines in April. It was this and in May and so forth. And that will be an infectious disease expert to address causation and plaintiff's injury claims. And then most importantly, we need defense themes. We need themes from the beginning of the case from discovery through trial. What are these themes? Responsibility, reasonableness, common sense to combat plaintiff's theme of profits over safety. We're circling back to the facts. We're focused on the facts. We want to establish that our clients were following the rapidly changing federal and state local directives, emphasizing that there were a lot of unknowns during this time and that it was impossible to make decisions then based on information we did not have at the time 
that was available later on in today. Now, society, as we know, appreciates when someone takes responsibility. This is not a notion of admitting liability, but it's taking responsibility that we did our best, that we were reasonable, that we followed the guidelines when they were presented to us. And these are the arguments we will make that we should make on behalf of our clients about taking responsibility. Some examples include arguing or, or presenting that we actively responded to the crisis by manufacturing products to help combat COVID-19 and to providing essential services during the pandemic, manufacturing products and or implementing safety measures to protect its customers and employees in accordance with applicable statutes and laws taking reasonable precautions and following industry guidelines during a time when people desperately needed various products and other essential services during the pandemic. Also, the company or the client changing hours for employees to make it easier for them during this pandemic, allowing employees to work from home, providing additional benefits. These are the types of things that, that display responsibility, reasonableness, and caring and empathy to the public. But on the flip side, we should also ask from the beginning of discovery through trial, what responsibility did the plaintiff take? Did they take responsibility? Oftentimes they won't, they'll never admit to that. But did the plaintiff mitigate their risks? Did the plaintiff social distance? Did the plaintiff take safety precautions, wear PPE, carry a hand sanitizer? Did the plaintiff assume unnecessary risk maybe when they had pre-existing conditions and were more vulnerable to COVID. And finally, we need to personalize our client, the corporate defendant. They are people too. Select an employee that's a great representative of the company to present and deliver this story along with counsel. Give the history of the corporate defendant from its inception. It may have started as a very small company and became what it is today but it had its beginning. Show the sacrifices that leadership made. Maybe there were no layoffs because leadership maybe cut back on their salaries or did some other efforts to make sure that no one lost their job during this quarantine. There may be a story that we had to close our doors during the pandemic. There may be an, we want to display the impact on the employees and families. The business corporate defendant may have also retooled or purpose, repurposed the company during the pandemic to help the public. The corporate defendant may also have donated time and money to help those in need during the pandemic. These are the stories that we want to tell. We want to personalize our clients and show empathy that everyone would understand that these were all changing times and different types of guidelines that were presented during this time. And we did our best. We acted reasonable. That's the most important thing. So to close, remember, our clients are most likely the heroes of the pandemic, the grocers, the providers of essential services. We want to remind the jury of this fact and get back to the facts and not the false narratives presented by plaintiff. We want to focus on the timeline of the pandemic and the evolving plan to ensure the safety of the employees and customers based upon the guidelines at the time of the incident. We must remember the standard is not perfection but reasonableness. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being involved in this panel. Now on to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And now I'd like, we do have a minute or two to take some questions. And so I'd like to hand it over to our Chief Marketing Officer, Diane Blaha, and our Vice President of Marketing, Melissa Storin, to uh, present some of the questions we've received to our panelists. Go ahead. California, what would you deem best practice to be uh, when issuing the W uh, the DWC one? Should uh, they wait for a confirmed test or presume positive by the physician? Rick, I'm going to direct this out to you. Uh, I know we all want to know about haircuts, but can you address this question? <laughs> yeah, we'll get back to the haircuts later. You know, I I going over this question. I think I think the is to. Um, through and um, offering the form to to the claimant 
I think it's not an admission of liability. It's a notice of when someone made the claim or we would look at it as like an accident. So if someone is, is uh, saying that they were exposed, I think we have to follow through with that process. Great, thank you. And this question goes out to Jim. How might waivers work to limit COVID liability exposure, Jim? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I think that they will be helpful, um, but you know, the reality is in the circumstances that we're working in, um, waivers have a limited application under state law. Uh, we have seen, for example, in many states that uh, children under 18 can't waive their, their liability and nor can their parents waive it for them. Uh, so, you know, I, I think trying to use waivers as a, is a wise precaution, but I think you, you have to understand that they're not a perfect uh, way to avoid liability. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we are at over our time, so Matt, I'm going to turn it back to you to close us out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Diane, and uh, thank you to all of our panelists today for uh, your uh, expertise and um, presentations on this important topic. I'd also like to thank all of our attendees today for uh, your time and participation and, and attention today. Uh, we will be sending out a link to the recording to all of the registered attendees today. Once again, thank you all. I wish you all a very pleasant rest of your day.